Well, hello everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, and it is episode number 219 of Goulet Q&A, here for another one of these. I was a little bit under the weather last week. After I shot Q&A, I crashed like hard that evening. I ended up staying home on Thursday, the day after I recorded it. Uh, it's not often I take a sick day, but I was down for the count. I think I slept like 16 hours that day or something crazy. Um, mostly kicked it. I still got a little bit of lingering stuff, so I have a cough drop here, but it's not going to slow me down from delivering another solid Q&A. Um, I took a few, few fewer, a uh, slight fewer questions last week. I'm going to do the same this week. I got five questions for you, but I'm still trying to make it an awesome packed one for you. Um, so let's see here. I've uh, been kind of laying low. Rachel and I are both getting, good over, getting over some illness, so on the Goulet family front, we've just been hanging out at home, doing kid stuff. Our kids are in swim lessons, just doing summer things, you know, enjoying nice family time. The one thing that has happened that has been kind of a game-changing event in the Goulet family is my kids are old enough where we can actually play like family video games together. Like in a, not a, you know, we're kind of like teaching our kids, but like we are playing like four player on Mario Kart. Uh, we have a Nintendo Switch and it is really, really fun. Like we can set different things for our kids to have like more assistance and stuff like that. And Rachel and I are doing it like full legit. And uh, we're like actually like competing against each other and racing against each other. And it's just like a dynamic of like us and our two kids all doing like one activity and being engaged and not like, oh yeah, we're all watching, you know, My Little Pony movie because that's what my daughter wants to do. But like, oh, we're actually all four of us do something that is of interest at once. And that's been just really cool. So my kids are having a blast. So we're like, yeah, if you can, you know, pack your lunch and like do everything to get ready for the next day early, you know, at nighttime, like we'll play some Switch together. And they're like getting really motivated and doing that. And we're like, heck yeah. <laughs> they get their stuff done. We get to play some video games with the kids. Like it's actually pretty fun. Anyway, so that's just kind of fun. A little, little update on the Goulet fam. Um, we have launched some new things this week, um, so I want to talk about those. Not a ton, ton of new stuff. It hasn't been a super heavy week for us, um, but we did launch some new things. We have Diplomat, which is a brand I've been talking about for a little while, um, so we will have launched it by the time this video launches. Um, so we have the Excellence, we have the Aero, A-E-R-O, not A-R-R-O-W. We have the Magnum, which is a blue one here, and then the Traveler as well. So um, as far as the pen breakdown go, these are a little bit on the higher range. These are a little bit on the lower range. Um, the Magnum is, is the lowest of the bunch, uh, the most entry level of the bunch. Um, kind of like a Lamy Safari-esque type pen, um, but it's got a steel nib. But the nib on the Traveler and the Magnum is a little bit springy. Like it's not a flex nib, but it's one of the springier steel nibs uh, of pens that I've seen. And you can actually get like a little bit of line variation to it without feeling like you're gonna break the nib. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Decent quality pens. These are all made in Germany um, and build quality is very solid. So these are really cool. They even have a flame version. So if you like the Kueco Fire Blue type of thing, you can get, um, shut my computer up here. <laughs> you can get this in like a flamed out version for a very affordable price for a flame pen. So that's pretty cool. Um, the arrow is the one that is like really taken me. Just the arrow and the excellence both like the the capping is just like so crisp. Mm. It's, uh, you know, all German made, Yovo nibs, really great quality. Um, you're gonna pay, you know, not like a super premium, but a little on the higher end for the nicer um, pens as far as steel nibs go. Um, but the fit and finish and build quality is phenomenal. So if you like a very kind of hefty, very solid feeling, nice fitting pen, um, you're probably gonna like these a lot. So Diplomat's been one of those like sleeper brands that we've kind of been aware of, haven't really gotten a ton of people asking us about it, but from time to time, but then once we started engaging with people that have interacted with the brand a lot, they got very loyal following. And so um, they have new distributorship and they're looking to kind of make some things happen. Um, so we were like, okay, what the heck? This sounds pretty good. And as we're getting to know them more, it's like, yeah, these are pretty solid pens. Um, so anyway, you can check those out. We have all those available on our site now. We're not carrying the full line of every diplomat, but it is something that we are like carrying what we feel is probably the most popular, most interesting, and then we might expand. So if there's something that we're not carrying that you are really interested in, let us know in the comments here in the video or contact my team on social media or through email or whatever. 
and that will help us to know what it is that you do want to see. Okay, so that's Diplomat. Um, oh, and we're also going to have this wooden desk set, which, oh, I don't have it on me, but um, I'll have to show that in a future one. I think Rachel and I are going to plan on featuring Diplomat in Right Now on Monday. Um, so we'll have that as a, as a quick reference, too. We'll, you know, have some pens inked up and play with them a little bit more in detail there, so you can check that out. Um, but uh, there's a desk set, a wooden, like, a wooden pen rest set that holds ink and stuff like that. Very like executive desk set kind of thing. We haven't carried a lot of that type of stuff, but this one's relatively affordable. It's around hundred bucks and uh, really solid wood and, and it looks really good. So, um, you know, we're just like, what the heck, let's try it out. Um, what else we got? Um, so Jerobon came out with five new colors and um, I'm just now kind of working out with them. They may be like rebranding a little bit to drop the J and just go with Urban, which I think is fine. Um, but uh, so I'm kind of like, I'm literally like in communication with them over email right now. Like, hey, is this, is this happening or what's, what's going on? So that may be in the works. Um, so in any case, I'll just call it Airbomb because that's shorthand anyway. So they came out with five new colors that actually look pretty good. I don't have the physical swabs here for you, but we have them on the site. They look really, really good. They're pretty vibrant colors. So these are not like 1670 or 1798 colors, like with the shimmer and all that kind of stuff. These are conventional Jerbon 30 mil colors and uh, Airbon 30 mil colors and uh, Verde Gris, Corel de Tropique, Rouge Granat, Bleu de Profondeur, and Bleu Kalanak. So Kalank, Kalank. Um, not a native French speaker here. I'm sure I butchered those terribly and my uh, sore throat is not helping anything, but um, I really like the intensity of the colors. They're not super intense, but they're a little more vibrant, which I think is, is good for them to kind of expand in the 30 mil line because most of the colors there are pretty subtle. Um, so that's kind of cool to see. And then their 30 mil colors are so well behaved. I mean, Jerobon is some of the best behaved, easiest to clean inks, fast drying, shading, all that kind of stuff. So um, really, really solid color. So if you're curious about those, pick up a sample or um, maybe try a bottle if you know you really love Jerobon as a brand. Um, I think you'll be you'll be pretty pleased with these new colors they came out with. Um, kind of along the lines of, of newer things or new newish added things, but not super super new is um, Clairefontaine Aquarelle. So I kind of alluded to these a little while ago, but I have them physically to show. So these are A5 lined notebooks that we have. It's just one product, um, but there's three different covers and. Most of our Claire Fontaine products, these ones included, we don't get to specify how many of which cover that we get. We buy it in a mix pack and we have to offer it as a mix pack. If you have a preference, there's one that's more of a yellow dominant, there's one that's a little more of a blue kind of orange dominant, and then there's one that's more of a magenta. Um, but uh, it's like an ink splatter thing. So it's something that we brought in. Um, it's not regularly available in the US. We brought it in as like a special order kind of thing. Um, and it's ink splatters. So it's like, yeah, that fits our vibe. Um, so it's just the covers, you know, it's a staple bound, thick staple bound notebook, 96 pages. Um, so it's a decent page count, um, not super thick, not super thin. Um, but it's their typical 90 gram Clairefontaine smooth white paper. The lines are pretty dominant. You know, if I show you the lines there, they're, they're very, very dark, very pronounced, um, you know, and it's kind of that, that purple color that Clairefontaine is known for. Um, and uh, really solid, solid build, nice notebooks. The paper performance on Clairefontaine paper is like basically kind of unmatched in my opinion. And the thing that I like about the pure white paper is it really shows off the ink well. So this could be a great kind of thing for like an ink journal or, um, you know, just a notebook around the office if you might want to carry it if you want to be like, yep, I'm the weird pen person. Here's my inky notebook. Could be kind of fun for you to have so you can pick some of those up. Um, and then some things that we have coming that are going to be relatively soon. I have a lot of stuff in the works that I don't have any dates for, so I can't really, I don't want to hype it up for you too much in advance, but some things that are like just around the corner for us is a couple of Stipula products. One of which um, we came out with this thing about a year ago that was called the Stipula Etruria Rainbow. So now they're they're coming out with a new one um, that's the Magma. So it's kind of the same layered colored one, but it's a yellow, red, and orange uh, color instead of kind of this rainbow color. 
but it's the same kind of format, larger size pen, piston fill, titanium flex nib, um, and it's going to have gold trim, like a matte gold. Looks really, really good. Um, we're getting them a little bit late to the game, but uh, I think they may be available elsewhere, but we're getting our first shipment of them maybe within the next week or so. So if you're excited about those, check it out. Um, and then we are getting our, I believe, our last shipment of the Ventidu Toco Ferro, which is this um, iron pen that has an orange ink window with a piston, a steel nib. Very cool pen. Um, they have been uh, very popular, very well received so far, very solid build pen. One of the heavier pens that we have, but still like kind of a pocket size. Um, we're getting the last of them and then they're gonna be gone. So if you were really interested in those, we haven't had them in a while. Um, but if you are interested in those, we're getting one more shipment. So when that comes in, if you're on the email list or something like that, um, go ahead and, and uh, plan to move on that. All right. So let's get started off with the questions that we have for this week, shall we? Um, pen and writing questions. So this is going to be the bulk of the questions for you here today. First one is from Marilyn G on Facebook. Can one get useful information about a pen nib by dipping the nib to test it? Or is it necessary to actually fill the pen with ink to get a true feel for how the nib will perform? This is a great question because um, obviously when you're testing pens, if you go to a pen show, if you're at a pen meetup, or maybe you're um, at a physical brick and mortar store and you're testing them, you want to get a sense for what it is, or maybe you're, you just bought a pen and you want to see if it's something you're really going to love or whether you want to return it or flip it or whatever, um, you're going to need to get an assessment of how it does. And not everybody has like the time to fill it up completely and, you know, carry it around for a week and get a full assessment of how it does in all situations. Um, so this is a, this is a very valid question that I'm glad you brought up. Um, so when you're talking about dipping a pen, you know, there are dip pens. That's a whole separate thing. Those are calligraphy pens, uses different ink, all that kind of stuff. But dipping fountain pens basically means you take the fountain pen, you take your bottle of ink and you just dip the nib and feed in enough to kind of saturate the whole thing. The feed will hang on to a decent portion of that ink and then you can write with it for, you know, a few lines or so before it kind of runs out of ink and dries up and then you go. So the question is, can you get a sense for how the pen actually writes and performs just by dipping it or do you have to go through the full ink up, write with it and all that kind of stuff and then clean it out and, and all that before you can truly assess. So um, this is really good and interesting because I've, I've um, spent some time with some different nib meisters and obviously they're, they're very interested in this. They're assessing the performance of nibs and feeds and uh, flow and stuff like that. Um, so what I will say is that you, you can accurately assess the performance of a nib and a nib alone by dipping it because all you need is a little bit of ink supply. Typically when you're testing a nib, you're not writing pages and pages and pages. Um, but you cannot get an accurate sense of the flow of the pen just by dipping it. Because essentially what you're doing by dipping it is you're kind of flooding, they're flooding the feed, you're getting it really saturated. When you first write with it, it's going to be really heavy. Um, so really if you're doing it, you want to flood it. And then what I do is I take like a bunched up paper towel or a tissue or something like that. I'll dip it and then I'll kind of like touch the tip of the nib to that to just wick a little bit of that excess and then start writing with it. If you just dip it and then go, it's going to just be a much heavier flow. And then if you do have any nib issues related to like the tines are pinched together and it restricts the flow or something like that, when it's first dipped, that might mask some of that. So you want to write with it enough so that you're getting, you know, some sense of the ink delivery to through the nib. Um, but you're not going to be able to write a page and a half and see if there's any kind of flow issue going on like further up in the feed. You know, if I take this pen, I'm not going to take apart the Twisby because that one's a little tougher, but I'll take this Edison here, right, as an example. So I'll give you a little bit of breakdown of how the pen works. I've got the ink reservoir up here, which in this case is a removable converter. I have the nib and feed here, which is inside the housing. Um, and if I pull out the nib and the feed, you can see here the nib and feed uh, the feed is actually quite long in this case. It's about an inch and a half or so. And so part of it's sticking out, you know, about this much of it. Oops. And part of it is hidden all the way up inside the grip. And this little part of the feed actually um, sticks out uh, through uh, the back of the feed housing. And that's what the converter kind of grabs onto in the back. So if you're dipping it, you're only getting ink 
up to about this much of it. So you're gonna get a sense for how the nib works because basically the nib, really all the working part of the nib is from this breather hole and that's where the slit starts. So that's really what the nib is all about. The underside of the nib, it's just a flat piece of metal. So that doesn't really matter. As long as you have ink in that slit, you're gonna get a sense for how the nib is performing. But the feed, that's got a lot more going on with it. It's got, let's see if it'll focus on it. Um, the feed has got a lot more going on. Um, it's got a little feed channel. There we go. So the feed has got this feed channel um, that goes all the way down here. It's very, 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 very thin. Works by capillary action, goes all the way from up here. So you could have some dried up ink. You could have a bit of machining you know, gunk or something like that, some silicone grease or something that's jammed up in here um, that when you dip the pen, it could work just fine. But then when you're actually trying to draw ink down through the reservoir, you could run into some flow issues there. So that you're not gonna tell just by dipping in. But in terms of the nib and uh, do you have proper alignment? Are the tines too close together? Is it feeling scratchy? That kind of stuff. You can tell all that by dipping it. So a lot of times that's what um, nib guys will do. Um, and there's different techniques too, guys or gals. Um, and so there may be maybe different techniques that happen. Um, you know, some people like to tune nibs and stuff on the pen. Some people remove the nib and tune it and then clean it and do the flow stuff. So it really depends on kind of what it is you're trying to assess. But as long as you understand uh, what it is you're trying to do, you can, you can do it to varying degrees. So I would say, you know, in general, if you're looking for a new pen or if you're, you're doing something like that, you're fine just dipping it and getting a good sense for how it writes because you can pretty much get that sense with the exception of, you know, the flow, um, like after, you know, half a page or so um, without having to fully, fully ink it up. And a lot of times brick and mortar stores, they won't even allow you to fully ink it up. Dip testing might be the only thing allowed. Or if you go to pen shows or, you know, pen meetups, usually people are a little more lax and they'll let you do whatever because they're going to clean it out anyway and they love doing it and they're going to do the same thing to your pens. So. You might, you know, just ask whoever's pen that you have if you're ever in doubt. Um, but that is, uh, that is about it. Cool. All right. Kyle, K-Y-L-1-E. Kyle, one E. Kyle, Kyle, whatever. On Instagram, Kyle. Um, should I wind the piston down as the ink gets lower on my Twisby? I see photos of where this pen has been done, but not sure if it needs to be done. Uh, that's a great question. You know, this is kind of a personal preference thing. Um, Twisby is one pen that has a fairly large ink capacity. But uh, I'll broaden the question just a little bit because I've been asked about this kind of thing, not just with Twisby, but with other pens too. The logic goes, you know, if I'm seeing inside a pen, and a Twisby is one pen where you can actually see the ink level without having to open up the pen or anything, um, and if I maybe want to increase the flow or it's not writing as I feel it should, or maybe I just feel like it needs to not have any air in there to keep the pressure of the thing going through the, you know, pen, uh, maybe I need to ratchet this thing down. You know, for this, um, I have my Eco here. I'm not gonna actually ratchet it down because then you know, it was gonna dump ink everywhere. You gotta point it so that the air is towards, you know, the top of the ink reservoir. Because if there's ink between the air and the feed, it's gonna spurt ink out. So I'll kind of do the, do this down. Da, 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 da. So I'll get all of the air out of my Eco T. This is technically the Eco T. There. So the only problem with that, okay, cool. So like I now have no air inside my reservoir. That's gonna help um, really in, in kind of two ways. Uh, in one way, it's going to help by, um, because it's got a larger kind of ink capacity here, if I'm traveling, changing altitudes or anything like that, I'm eliminating a lot of the air uh, from inside the pen, which is going to greatly decrease my risk of having like burping and leaking and stuff like that due to pressure uh, changes inside the pen because there's, there's no air. Ink is mostly water and you can't compress water. You can only compress air. So you're gonna have less instability inside the pen. Um, particularly if you're very, very low on ink, um, that can be a handy little thing to do. Um, the other thing is if you want to actually flood your feed, if you're using a shimmering ink or a high sheening ink and you want to really feed, draw that feature out, um, you can, with the ink pointed down, very slowly kind of force more ink down into your grip and into your feed and it will write wetter. 
and then you can go nuts uh, and do that. I think that might be part of the reason um, why people do that for the most part. If you have a properly tuned, properly operating pen, you should not need to ratchet your piston down, okay? Ink works by capillary action, and the gravity from the pen, sorry, the gravity from the earth is going to pull the ink um, so that it touches the back of that feed. And the, as soon as the ink touches the back of the feed, that restricted channel in the feed, called the feed channel, um, is going to draw the ink down through capillary action. You don't need to force it, there's no pressure. In fact, there's an, there's an air channel that's built into the feed, that's how these things are designed. There's an air ink interchange that happens in the design of a fountain pen. If you think of a fountain pen, it's basically a controlled leak. That's how these things are designed. So you're trying to leak an exact amount of ink, exchange it with air, Otherwise, you're going to end up like you have with the um, straw. Like if you take a straw that you have at like a restaurant or at home or whatever with a cup of water, you put it down in the water, you put your finger over it, you lift it up, all the water stays in the straw. Like if you had that in a pen, it ain't going to write. So you have to have that air ink interchange in here. And so that's happening no matter how much air you have inside your pen. So other than that, temperature or the, the the pressure fluctuation thing like if you have a very large ink capacity pen you can have some instability if there's a lot of air and a little bit of ink with the pen it might have a tendency to burp a little bit more or or have the ink kind of draw down into the cap if you're you're moving it around some of that can happen um, not just specific to a twisby but it could be anything um, but that is uh, that's generally the case the thing that I don't love about this, specifically with a Twisby, is that um, like any piston filling pen, when you ratchet the piston down, that leaves the cap in an un, uh, you know, unseated state. So there's a gap here between the body of the pen and the piston because as you twist it, the piston knob comes out as the piston rod goes down. And that's the way most pens are designed. Not all pens are designed that way. For example, the stipula Ventidu Toco Ferro here, as I twist it down, it actually twists in the reverse direction, as I twist it down, it stays in the exact same place. The piston does not come out. So in this case, I could do that all day long and it would not make any difference whatsoever. Um, the advantage of having a pen that's designed this way is that it wouldn't affect your posting at all, okay? Now, Twisby with their 580, 580 all in this case, they technically don't advertise the pen as posting. It can seat onto the back of the pen. The problem is, you know, if you go and you ratchet the piston down, like right now when I have it all the way up and closed, it's, it's very well seated here. If I ratchet the piston down, that leaves the piston knob in a very loose state, right? And if I go and I cap it on here, it's gonna leave that cap like rattling around. And that's just really not very good for the pen. That's not very good for you. It could actually make it to where you twist the, the piston rod and can cause you to burp the pen accidentally as you write. So in that case, it would not be particularly advantageous. So that's the only reason I don't love doing it specifically with Twisby pens, but it could be any piston pen, um, is because it might, might cause you to actually do more harm than good. Um, it's not exclusive to piston filling pens. It could be with any real piston type mechanism. For example, if you have a cartridge converter pen, I know a lot of people that do this with either Lamy pens or any other cartridge converter pen really. You can do the same thing where you pull your converter down to get some of that air out of there. There's much less ink capacity in here, so you don't really have to worry about burping and stuff quite as much. It's probably even less of a reason to have to do that with a cartridge converter pen. Just some people get in the habit of doing it and they like it. Um, one thing that I remember from my earliest days in pens, um, sometimes when I would use a nib size that was actually finer than what I was really hoping, or I, was, I wanted to get an ink to look darker than it naturally wanted to, I would draw that piston down, force more ink into the feed so that it would either write wetter or write broader a line, and that was one way to kind of hack it a little bit. So that is one way I could see you could do that. You know, I've got a Twisby Eco T here with a broad nib, and I might be like, I really want something that writes more like a double broad, but they don't make a double broad. Um, I may be like one of three people in the world that would be in that situation, um, but I'm like, I'm gonna draw it down, really flood this thing. That way when I write, you know, I write thank you notes and stuff like that that go out um, in our orders. 
um, as well as my team does way more than I do. But <laughs> um, if I'm doing that and I'm using a particular sheening or shimmering ink, I maybe want to be like, yeah, let me just really dump this on. Um, I might force some ink down and then I write those, those few words and it looks like I'm a, a nib size or two even broader than it is. Um, so that's some advantage I could see to doing that. But really it's up to you. It's a personal preference thing, not required at all. Once you fill the pen, if you fill it properly and you start writing with it, you can just let it go until it runs out of ink and you don't need to do anything with it until it's dry. Cool. This next question is from Kunai Neck on Twitter. Which branded converters that you can buy have the greatest ink capacity? I know the Con 70 is pretty good, but what about the others? Okay, so uh, the Con 70, um, I'm going pretty deep on some of these pen questions this week. Y'all can be geeking out with me, that's cool. Um, so I have here my beloved Pilot Custom 74 in blue, and uh, it has the legendary Pilot Con 70 converter, which is a really interesting converter. It's, it's not a piston converter like most others. Um, it's more of a kind of vacuum button filler type converter. Um, essentially the way that this converter works, it's a larger converter than a normal piston filling one. Just to give you perspective, um, let me show the Pilot Con 40, which is the standard now for the Pilot's um, piston converters. Um, so just to give you a, an idea of the scope of these two converters. So the Con 40 is easily half an inch shorter, maybe three quarters of an inch shorter, and the ink capacity is less than, it's about half of the um, Con 70. So you know, let me get that all the way up there. So um, quite a bit different in terms of its actual performance, but the Con 70 doesn't fit on every pen. It's a pretty large converter. You know, I can't fit it on a Falcon, for example. Um, so, um, this is something that we have some pretty good metrics on because we uh, measure the ink capacity of every single pen in our store. And uh, the way that we did that um, was by measuring first every single cartridge and every single converter separately. So I know the exact ink capacity of every single converter that we carry at Goulet Pens and in some cases even more because we've dropped some products over the years. Um, we measured the ink capacity of every single grip so that whatever pen model that we're talking about, we know the grip plus the cartridge, the converter, the eyedropper, whatever has been done to it, we can tell any combination of those three what is the ink capacity. And that has been a tremendous labor of love. Um, I you know, I have been working closely with Crystal. She's a member of our team who spends a lot of her time doing some of the detailed measurements of this stuff. Um, she is often sight unseen on our site, but um, she has been kind of the, the champion to help me uh, get all those measurements accurate. And so um, I have actually stats for all of the converters that we sell. Um, now the thing I'll say before I get deep into these numbers is because, is, is, is basically um, your choices are very limited. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not like you can go, I want an Edison pen, but I want to put a Con 70 converter on it. It really doesn't work like that. You may have the option of one or two converters on a given pen model, but largely they're proprietary and you can't swap them across brands. You can't really do much about it. You may be able to use a cartridge instead of a converter, or maybe you can eyedropper it instead of using a converter, um, but you can't really swap converters in between pens with the exception of like Pilot where they make a couple different converters or um, standard international converters. Um, you can really get you know, a regular version and then a mini version on, on a couple of different brands. And, and because those are standard international, you can kind of swap some of those. So I could go on for a long time about this specifically, but the thing I'll say is basically you may look at the overall ink capacity with a converter or something like that on a specific pen, that might go into your buying decision or may make a difference in terms of your preference and how you actually use it. But largely, you don't have a whole lot of choice. So it's really probably not going to be the leading deciding factor for you. The overall ink capacity might, but even that is gonna come into play into how wet the pen writes and the nib size that you choose, because it's not all 
pens are equal. So one pen might have a greater ink capacity, but it may be such a wetter writing pen that you might actually run out of ink sooner than you would on another pen that has less ink capacity. So you got to take a lot of things into account. But that said, I will still try to answer this question to the best of my abilities. Um, so the Con 70, the Pilot Con 70, which is this kind of vacuum button filling one, is the largest. Because of its design, it does not have as much of the mechanism that takes up the space. So the actual ink reservoir is the highest of any converter that I have tested before. So you are looking at around 1.1 milliliters of ink capacity on a Con 70, which is really pretty good. That's actually more than a, than a um, Twisby Mini or a Twisby Vac Mini. You know, the 580 is, is a little bit higher. These are piston filling pens, which usually have larger ink capacities. This is more like a 1.4 milliliters. So getting to a cartridge converter and, and having 1.1 milliliters, it's actually pretty decent. So um, that, that right there is part of the appeal of the Con 70. Um, aside from that specific converter, everything else kind of takes a jump down. Um, most converters, most kind of standard, typical size converters, which includes most standard internationals, brands like Aurora, Jinhao, Lamy, those are gonna be around 0.86 milliliters, okay? So it's a noticeable little drop, maybe a 25% drop or so from a Con 70, but still very respectable. You know, that's really kind of the standard of what you're gonna get. And there may be some variance, five or 10%, you know, kind of around that range, but around that kind of like 0.8 milliliter range is gonna be where most pens fall in terms of converters, with the exception of some that are less. There's some that are a little lower, a little lower that might be um, around or slightly more than 0.6 milliliters. Um, those include Waterman, Platinum, Parker, Monograppa that has the agitator in it. The Monograppa is a standard international, but um, if it has an agitator in it, that takes up some of the ink capacity. Um, and then the Pilot Con 40 is right in there as well. Pilot Con 50 was slightly more, but not much. Um, you can get kind of smaller, like mini versions of standard international converters, um, which would be um, Kaweco and the Monteverde Mini. Um, also Nemesign kind of falls in this range too. Um, those end up being around like the 0.55 or 0.6 milliliter range. And that's really about as low as it gets, okay? So then you're looking at like standard international short cartridges. That's around that size that you're kind of talking at that point. Um, but uh, that's basically it. So you're kind of ending up in that like 0.6 range, 0.8 range, and then the Con 70 kind of stands alone in that 1.1. Aside from that, you're looking at either refilling cartridges, which if refilling a cartridge, you can get a little more ink capacity out of it. Um, than you can having a converter because you don't have to have any room for that mechanism. Um, or if you go to eyedropper converting, that's where you can get the most ink capacity if your pen is able to do that. Um, obviously, piston filling pens wouldn't fall in that category, but if you have cartridge converter pens that don't have holes in it, don't have any metal internal components, and um, have threads that can be sealed either with an O-ring or with silicone grease, eyedropper converting might be an option, and we've usually tried to put that on our site when that is a possibility. Um, so there you go. There you have it. So, um, you know, those are the brands that you're looking at. And if you have questions about any individual pen or model, we advertise the ink capacity of all of them on our site. All right. Next question is from Stuart Jackson, 612 on Instagram. As a previous pen manufacturer yourself, could you please explain how the beautiful marbled and swirling pattern that you find in these acrylics and celluloid are formed? Um, yes, sort of, <laughs> I will do my best. So I did a little bit of like resin mixing and things like that. So I have some insight based on my own experimentations. Um, I have some, you know, knowledge just from being in the industry and talking to people. Uh, but I do not know in depth for sure the manufacturing process for making, you know, beautiful swirly resins such as these because it's extremely proprietary. Um, and it's a, it's a trade secret basically for exactly how they do it. So I can't say, oh yeah, take this chemical components, you know, blah, 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 mix it with this at this point, use this tool, do it, you know, there's techniques here that I just don't know. Um, so everything that I'm saying here is gonna be somewhat hypothetical and somewhat based on 
how I believe it to work. Um, and it's just kind of for your general interest and curiosity. Um, it's not meant to be taken as, uh, as, you know, these are like trade secrets I'm revealing or anything. This really is actually digging up probably more on the experimentations that I did when pouring my own resins uh, nine years ago. Uh, than anything else. So um, when you're looking at things that are multiple colors like this, it's a relatively straightforward process. You know, there's kind of two, two main ways that resins are made, in pens at least. There's injection molding, and then there's cast resin, okay? Injection molding is pretty straightforward. It's like, uh, you know, Lamy pens, for example. Um, if you watch the, like, Lamy How It's Made videos, I had a little bit of their injection molder in there. Um, it's a huge metal block that's engineered very specifically. It injects hot plastic, hot melted plastic uh, pellets and it injects it into the mold, sits there for about 30 seconds while it hardens. It can usually do like six or nine or however many pens that you design it to do at once. Once it cools a little bit, pulls them all out, boom, you got a Lamy Safari body or whatever. And then it goes and dumps it. And this machine can run continuously 24 hours a day. Very efficient process, very um, expensive to set up, but ends up being like uh, very effective per piece if you're doing like a more of a mass production kind of setting. Um, materials like this, this is a cast resin, okay? With cast resin, you can get um, more interesting materials, more contrasting colors and things like that um, because it's more of a kind of a handmade deal, right? So the way they make these resins is they basically pour it into a giant slab, okay? So they pour these resins um, and then they're adding some mixture of dyes and powders, maybe ribbons of some kind, um, different materials it might be, you know, you might see some, some that are kind of like a flecked material. Um, those usually they like take chunks, the material that they've broken up, they pour it into a slab and then they dump those chunks in and the chunks get cast into some uh, contrasting color or something like that. Um, so there's lots of different kind of techniques that I vaguely understand. And if you look at them, you're kind of like, oh, clearly there's like multiple colors that have been kind of swirled together. Um, but basically the process is it's kind of cast into a slab, they pour colors, and then they will in some fashion kind of go through and mix them into some specific like pattern, you know, and then, um, then they just let it harden and then uh, it's cut into rods or maybe turned into rods. And then when you turn it on a lathe into a pen, it ends up with these crazy kind of swirls that are all over the place. Um, so it's very interesting, very interesting kind of stuff. And I would buy these things in like, you know, blanks uh, of material back when I was making pens uh, back in the day. Now, this is a relatively straightforward one. This is the um, Edison Nouveau Premier Delphinium uh, that we had from, uh, this was summer of last year um, as our, our seasonal color. Um, this is pretty straightforward. There's not a ton of pearlescence in this one, so it's more or less just a blue and purple kind of dye that was used, uh, I imagine, with like a white ribbon that's like a, a solid color ribbon that is kind of separating the two colors. Um, if you go to something that is like our cherry blossom, um, this is that cast resin again, and this one has a lot of pearlescence to it, and I'm gonna try to show you as close up as I can to get you the great detail of this one. Um, there we go. So this one not only has some color and a little bit of ribboning to it, but it's got this very shiny pearlescent effect. So these pearlescent things, that's not coming from a dye, that's most likely coming from some kind of powder, like some kind of metallic mica powder or something like that, that is catching the light and causing it to shimmer in the sunlight, right? So um, that would just be a matter of mixing a certain ratio of that metallic powder into whatever color you have, in this case, pink. And then as you swirl it around, those powders are kind of swirling around within the material and it leaves kind of not just the white swirls in here, but then there's swirls of the metallic kind of within those white swirls and that gives it a lot of that depth. It's not a super complicated process, but I imagine it's the kind of thing like you have to understand the exact ratios, the time that you mix it, when do you put in the powder, how much do you stir it and all these kinds of things. So. I think it's one of those things, um, like most trade secrets probably, if you know exactly how to do it, it's not that 
complicated to do, but it's probably super complicated to figure out how to do it because they probably went through 100 iterations before they nailed that one down. So, um, you know, hopefully that gives you at least a little bit of insight and appreciation. Um, when you mentioned uh, celluloid, celluloid is kind of a step even beyond any of this because with resin, you basically mix the resin, you let it harden over a relatively short period of time. Some resins can cure in a few hours, other ones might be a couple of days. Um, celluloid takes two to three years to harden, okay? So with most celluloids, it's so proprietary that I don't even really know how it's done, quite frankly. Celluloid is a natural material. It's like made of like the same like um, uh, kind of stuff that like the old films were made out of, like the extremely flammable <laughs> nitrocelluloid. Um, same kind of stuff. It's a natural material and in the curing process, it is hazardous, you know what I mean? So it's, it's very difficult to work with, it takes forever. It's made of um, basically kind of like cotton uh, resin. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's a natural material, it moves, it can warp as it cures. So it's gotta be fully, fully cured. If you have a pen that's made of celluloid that hasn't 100% cured, the pen can actually warp and like turn into an, like an oval shape over time. If you ever have vintage pens and um, they were made with inadequate celluloid, they may warp and change to the point where like the cap won't fit anymore and all that kind of stuff. So celluloid is kind of a whole other beast, um, but I imagine there's probably some principles that are similar with celluloid, but there's some, some techniques of celluloid that I've seen that I'm like, I have no idea how that was made. Um, so that I can't really give you a lot of insight on, but um, it is really fascinating uh, things to think about. Um, and then the last thing kind of on those um, is something like, um, you know, this, where there's actually, this is the stipula Aturia rainbow. This one has actually been layered. Or if you think about like the, um, you know, the famous like Omas Arco, right? Like that was actually um, cut. So it was, it was one color that was made. It was cut into very thin pieces. And then it was um, um, basically glued back together or cast back together. Um, with a very specific number of layers. Um, that is a technique that can be used with celluloid or resin. In this case, this is resin, um, and this was done. And uh, this, I believe, you know, they, they did a technique to actually kind of blend the colors. So they cut ribbons of, or not ribbons, but like, you know, kind of slabs, like very, very thin slabs of this material. And then they kind of like chemically bonded in between the two. It was, it's because it's not like a hard color line in between these they actually kind of like transition a little bit in color. So I believe they did something to kind of like almost melt or blend two colors. Um, again, this is kind of a, a special stipula thing um, that they have on this and then the magma that's coming. Um, but that's kind of the principle there. If you're seeing like hard crisp lines, either on a celluloid or resin, that's how that's happening. It's, it's a purely mechanical process um, of, um, you know, uh, uh, laminated. Uh, is called the process uh, and that just is a lot of work and it takes forever so that's typically why you see pens that have like those kind of layered designs like that uh, usually cost more because it's a lot of work or like the um, Visconti uh, like Wall Street you know that Wall Street uh, celluloid um, kind of the same thing that has happened there um, it's expensive very labor intensive process all right I'm gonna close out this week on an ink question so this is from Parky J uh, four Park J, four on Instagram. How should I use the blotting paper attached to a Lamy ink bottle? The two sides seem different. Okay, going pretty deep on this question. I'm really, really going deep on all these questions. I just felt like nerding out this week, I guess. Um, so anyway, so you have a Lamy bottle. Lamy is a very interesting, very practical, kind of unconventional um, ink bottle. But the one most unique thing that Lamy has is actually, and I'll show you this, um, they have this roll of, of um, paper down here, um, and it is meant for wiping off the nib after you fill it from the bottle, okay? So the bottle is very uniquely designed. You know, aesthetically, some people think it's cool, some people think it's the weirdest looking bottle. Um, I'll leave that up for you to determine. Maybe you can leave in the comments what you think. Um, but either way, Lamy has this paper that's kind of cool, and they're the only ones that I know that does this. Um, Unfortunately, the paper is not replaceable uh, unless you buy another bottle of ink. So, you know, I would say use it more sparingly. Um, but yeah, it's this paper and it's 
honestly kind of looks like a roll of toilet paper, which is sort of like what it is for your nib. Um, it's meant after you, you fill the bottle, you know, you fill the pen. And it's kind of cool because it's got like this very long, flat, um, you know, surface, which, which actually is a practical function um, because it has this, um, you know, reservoir down here below all of this that allow you to get your nib really far down into the bottle. So it allows you to maximize your filling directly from the bottle. If you didn't have this area down here, this would be like one of the worst bottles to fill because you wouldn't be able to get the ink up to the spot where it actually fills from the pen. You know, most pens, they are not gonna fill directly from the tip. They're gonna fill all the way back here where the feed mates up to the grip of the pen. So you gotta actually insert the entire feed down into the pen. So here, um, because I'm able to get it really far down, I'm able to fill much, much deeper into the bottle without having to use a syringe or something like that or decanting into another bottle. But anyway, because you're dipping so much of the nib down into the bottle, um, they include this paper um, to be able to wipe off the surface of your nib after you've filled it, okay? And the paper does have two sides. Um, one side has this, um, you know, this, uh, uh, what's it called? you know, kind of design on it, um, imprinting, kind of like you have with like a paper towel or toilet paper, right? And the other side is relatively flat um, and feels a little glossier, right? That's the side that you're meant to kind of hold with your fingers and then you're meant to wipe the nib with this more um, printed side because that is more absorbent. So that's meant to kind of suck the paper up off of your nib, suck the ink up off your nib and uh, the, the other side acts as somewhat of a barrier so that you're not just using this really absorbent paper to suck the ink from your nib directly onto your fingers, right? <laughs> Even though some of that might happen. Um, so that's why there's two different sides of it. So you're meant to grab the, the smooth side and then you wipe it with the printed side. And that's how it works. Voila. Cool? All right. Um, that's it for this week. Uh, my question of the week for you this week is what is your favorite ink bottle? You know, there's some cool ones like this. You know, the Pilot uh, Iroshizuku is a pretty cool bottle. You know, there's some other ones that might be out there, so I would love to hear in the comments what you think is your favorite ink bottle. I'm not talking brand or, you know, price or any of that kind of stuff, just the bottle design. What do you think is your favorite? Uh, and then my writing prompt for this week for you is, um, you know, for you to actually get out your pen, write something down, is to make a list of five people that you wish that you could meet from any point in history. As they're like alive, not just like, you know, meeting their, their, you know, body in the ground kind of thing. But if you could like, yeah, I would love to sit down and have a conversation with this person, anyone from history, who would it be? So you can just make a list for yourself. Feel free to share it socially if you want to, but um, just thought it'd be a nice little prompt for you to pull out your pen and have a little brain power behind something. That's it for this week. You can check out a lot of the products that I talked about here on GooleyPens.com. Learn more about them and purchase them if you are so inclined. Um, thanks so much for watching. It was great to spend time with you this week. I got through without really having a coughing fit, so I'm very happy with myself. <laughs> I'm actually using the same cough drop this entire time. Ricola is the way to go. Not a sponsor. I just love Ricola. Anyway, hope you have a great week. Thanks so much for watching, and right on.